What's up, everybody? It's Sparrow with a Gun here from Sleepless Nights with another episode on Elite Dangerous. Uh, we're starting things off in the map menu here today. Why is my cursor there? Go away. Thank you. Um, so we're starting things off today by looking at the map a little bit. I plotted us a route, which is right at the edge. I think it's 999 light years, so I mean it's right at the edge. Um, unfortunately, Colonia is still a little bit away. I was kind of excited thinking it wasn't that much further away. I think it's something like 9,000. So it would basically be the equivalent of like nine trips left. So this is just kind of an arbitrary point that I picked. It looked kind of cool. The distance was um, agreeable and so on and so forth. Um, and I will point this out as well. It does matter. Uh, in the last episode we talked about using the filter now on your route planning which is a really, really nice feature. Uh, but it does matter if you adjust this. So for example, if I'm on the main map menu where the filter is applied and then you switch to realistic, you'll see the, the route recalculate and it goes a different route. Um, so it's a good idea. I mean, you can look at stuff in realistic, but always make sure if you're using a filter for your route that you actually stay um, in the map mode with the filter applied before you actually plot your route or at least before you leave the window so that you can basically make sure that you're you're getting the right route because otherwise it would be like ah i did my route planning wait how did i get stranded uh which would not be a good thing i did have a couple of people mention and i should have actually looked that up maybe we'll do that when we start our jump here um but there was a few that mentioned, are, am I going to plan routes around the new neutron stars that can do like the 300% frame shift jump thing? I'm leery of them because basically I've never done it before. I'm not in a beta where whatever happens in that stays in that and it doesn't affect my main save. And I've seen videos of people that got too close or messed up the, the approach or whatever. And it pretty much ends up getting their ship crushed by a gravity well. So, basically, it's a neat idea and all, but I am very leery of actually attempting it without watching at least a few more YouTube videos or something on it to see how exactly you're supposed to do it properly and safely before I start doing that kind of stuff. And I did mean to check... I wanted to look in the filter and see if it has a neutron star filter or not. We've got all these... Non-sequence star, white dwarf, wolf rayet, carbon, and then there's all the letter type. Proto stars. Mm. I don't. Ooh, show trade route. There's trade routes now. That's cool. I forget. I forgot about that. Um, actually, that might have been there for a while. Now that I think, I haven't done any real trading things, so I don't know how all that works and if it's been in place for a while or not. Um, I feel like those have been around for a little bit at least. I love the stars though. The way the stars are densing up is just awesome. But yeah, the, the trade stuff's probably been in there, the trade routing. Um, I don't know, they've updated a lot of stuff in the last patch so I'm, I'm not really sure what came from what. I don't think I did my scanner on that last system, which was in my bad. Um, but yeah, so I don't know that there's actually a way to plan uh, your route around Neutron Stars, unless one of those is the like official name, and I just don't know what it is. You know, like, if it's Carbon Stars or whatever, you know, and that's, a, that's the actual equivalent or something. Um, actually, truth be told, I don't really know I don't really know what some of those were as far as like a carbon star and stuff like that uh, the white dwarfs we've seen we've been around and stuff like that and the, the wolf rayat we've seen a couple of but um, but yeah so you know it, it's it's an interesting setup trying to plan out routes now we probably won't see as many um, versatile stars, I guess you could say. No, well, not versatile, but um, varied, I suppose, since I'm leaving my filter only to refuelable 
So we're not really going to stop and arrive at like dwarf stars or anything where you're like, oh, you know, because we're kind of not looking for those. So with that in mind, it might reduce some of the variety that we see, but me, you know. But overall, I mean, I do, I do really like that feature though. It definitely takes a lot of the focus off of trying to plan and make sure you're doing things a certain way. It, it to me, it really alleviates the fear of being stranded, basically, because that was always one of my biggest concerns with um, the exploration system was like if I don't plan out my route really carefully I'm gonna end up like flying off into a star somewhere and just you know not being able to scoop off of it and that was my last jump and now I'm dead in the water um, and I know there's the things like the fuel rats and stuff that'll come out and refuel you but I don't know how they will find you or whatever and I don't know how you like do you have to stay online the whole time? Do they like send you a message? It's like, hey, we're out here. Log in when you can. You know that. Kind of, I don't know how that works. It's a really cool idea. I won't lie. I really like that idea that there's basically um, a, a, a triple A kind of thing. Roadside assistance. Um, Hello, OnStar. Yes, I'm out of fuel in the Nebula system. I need. Uh, I, I need a. I need a tow truck. You know. Um. And I do think it's kind of cool that they, like, embraced that as far as the Frontier started developing things like the, um, now they have the, I don't know how they did it before, because the Fuel Rats have been around for a while, or whatever they're called, I might be getting the name wrong, my bad. Um, but they've been around for a while in the game, and I feel like, I could be mistaken, but I feel like they were around before they made the Fuel Transfer Limpets. And I think, I, because I always remember thinking it was because of them that Frontier did that was like, hey, I never thought about that, but yeah, let's make a way that they can basically do a, a tow truck. Um, so it kind of makes me wonder, like, how did they do it before you had that? Before you had the fuel limpets? It's like, how do you give other people fuel? Um, so that was an interesting thing that I never quite understood, and again, it could be because I was wrong and they only came about after that. Um, but it was still just one of those where you're like, hmm, that's that's neat. I wonder how they I wonder how they came up with that. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty cool, and it's very nice. I mean, for players to be like, hey, I'll go around and help other players. I guess it almost is like a healer in other MMOs. You know, um, it's like support class. Now I do know that they've changed some of the the with the advent of the engineers update. They added some of that stuff where like. If you're playing in a wing, one guy can have lasers that, like, raise shields rather than reduce them, and so they'll shoot their allies to, like, bring their shields. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. They're kind of making it, like, MMO party group type of thing. You know, you have your healer, your tank, your DPS, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, that's pretty interesting. I've, I've rarely seen that done in, like, a sci-fi piloting type thing where you're flying a spaceship, you know where you see like classes and things like that. So that was like, that was an interesting idea. Um, my hat went off to him for that. Cause I was like, how do you have classes and things in a, in a ship pilot based MMO kind of thing? Uh, and then they came up with all the stuff where it was like supply drops and, you know, I guess that makes sense. You could carry like, um, I don't know what some all of, or what what all is available i know there's the shield recharge upgrade thing you can get from certain engineers from i think it's one of the beam lasers or something isn't it it's like you can upgrade the beam weapon or something to raise ally shields or something like that i forget how it works but you could make like a support class i guess you could have it like you know where it has some kind of um deployable ammo crates or something, right? Where it's, you know, you, you kind of like a heat sink launcher, but it'd be like an ammo dump, ammo cache, whatever. Um, you know, and you could hit the, hit the like, hard point button and it would and shoot out like a something they could scoop up with their cargo scoop or something like that. Um, I suppose that would, that kind of stuff, and then coupled with like the healing beam for the shields and things, um, 
I don't know if there's any kind of like maintenance or, or, or uh, repair limpets that you could equip to do hull repairs on other people's ships and things. But stuff like that, I could see making it kind of like a straight up support um, or healer class, whatever you want to call it. That would be kind of cool. Um, I'm always interested in how developers, when they come up with a new setting for a game that isn't real common, or at least not common for the genre they chose, how they come up with um, basically how to blend the established genre gameplay with the newer weird setting that they came up with. Um, I think another example of that would be stuff like Division recently, in recent memory that I can think of, where it's like, you know, your dystopian uh, apocalyptic third-person shooter, which seems more like a Fallout kind of game than a, than a traditional MMO. Um, but then they did have stuff where it was like you had the support class with like the, um, the pulse and you could do med kits and medical stations and they could recharge ammo if they were in med- you know, things like that. To where it's like you actually could have people in incursions and things running in different, uh, a full party of different classes type of thing. Um, so I'm always interested, I mean, when it, when it goes traditional, uh, fantasy MMO, WoW, or Diablo, or something like that, where it's like medieval wizards and, and clerics and stuff, I mean, that's, that's, uh, let's be honest, Dungeons and Dragons and stuff is a large part of where a lot of those, like, standard classes came from, so it's not uncommon. You know, whenever you're in, like, a medieval fantasy, it's like the cleric's the healer, the wizard's the, you know, the magic area of effect guy, AoE dude, or the CC guy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and your barbarian's gonna be, like, your tank DPS hybrid, and the paladin's, like, a cleric or a healer DPS hybrid, tank hybrid, you know, things like that. Um, but, so, because those kind of establish them, it's not really hard to figure out who would be what in those kinds of games. But when you get, like, modern-day military, or like this, where it's spaceships or something, it does make you scratch your head a little bit, where you're like, okay, what class is what now? You know, like, what role do they all play? Um, I actually was very interested in, like, the Old Republic, how they blended Star Wars with that kind of stuff was an interesting idea. Even Elder Scrolls Online was still kind of in that medieval fantasy, so you had like wizards and cleric type builds and rogues and tanks and things. But the Old Republic was interesting as far as like how do you blend it with Star Wars and it was kind of like your um the Jedi Knight uh Guardian. Not yeah, like the Guardian was more like the tank, the um Sentinel was kind of like your DPS guy, the consulars were more like your um, ranged or healer, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was interesting seeing how they made classes to suit the setting. I'm, I'm always interested in the, in the development side of that, how they come up with things like that. Um, I always find it really neat what, what they come up with and what their process is for figuring things out, but especially with something like Elite that is so out of the normal element of that. It's like, you know, that makes it, that's very interesting to see what people come up with. Or the developers, rather, not just people in general, but... Um, but I mean, you know, of course that's gonna interest me. RPGs are kind of like my heart and soul of gaming kind of thing. I mean, I play all kinds of stuff. The only things I never really got into was a lot of sports games, and oddly enough, fighting games, like, um, uh, arena-type Tekken and Street Fighter and stuff like that. And a uh, good friend of mine, Caden Redfield, it's often does stuff with me on my channel and things. In, in in real life, he's always like making fun of me because I I it, like in the background in reality, non YouTube related. I'm I've I very much like a lot of combative stuff, uh, martial arts and weapons and guns and you know I like all that kind of stuff. I'm I'm a I'm a weapon and martial arts nut kind of thing. Not in terms of skill, but in terms of um, curiosity and intrigue. Like, I love it. I'm not. I won't say that I'm some like master, you know, black belt or anything because I'm not. But I, it's one of those. I would love to be that though. You know, as opposed to some people that are like a pacifist or something. I'm no. I, I'm very much a like. I love weapons and combat and things. I'm always like, you know, when you watch movies and things that are like the raid or. Um, you know, things like that. You're, I'm, I'm always kind of like, what did he do there? That was a neat move. Ooh, what was that? You know, stuff like that. 
So he's always teasing me, basically, because I love so much of that stuff and I'm always looking into and trying to learn more and fascinated by it. And then, and then I suck at fighting games. I really do. Like, there is there is no sugarcoating there. I won't boast and try and be like, ah, yes, I'm the best. No. Um, he is way more passive. I would never, I don't think he's actually like as, as far as to say he's like a pacifist or anything. But he's definitely more passive than I am. And the funniest thing is he is way better at fighting games than me. Like, he will just run circles around me in stuff like Street Fighter and Tekken. Um, and it's just really He just never... He, he always thought that was hysterical, and he never really got over that. That He was like, you always love, like, real-life martial arts and stuff. How come you're so bad at this? And I was like, well, probably the same reason you're so good at it. And, you know, it's like... And, and don't really know some of the stuff. So th that's always been funny, but for that reason, because I'm awful at them, I never really got into them all that much. Um, the two exceptions, well, there's probably three exception uh, exceptions, actually. I like Tekken. I'm still really bad at it, but I like Tekken. Um, I, I always thought the characters in his, I mean, they're very anime, but they're still kind of interesting and it's a little different, particularly the newer ones. Um, what was the new, the newest one that I played, I think, was Tekken 6. I didn't play it a lot, but I played some of it. And they added, a like, a RPG kind of single-player type mechanic to it, which was weird. But I liked it a lot better. Like, if they made just a game like that, I like the characters of Tekken enough, I would love to play something like that. Um... But for me, the two reasons I never was big on fighting games was, you know, I was always bad at them, and then the repetition, that if they didn't do something like a brawler, where, but if it was just like a two-dimensional, you're on the left, he's on the right, you know, round one fight kind of thing, and that's all you did, even when there were cutscenes and stories and reasons they were fighting, it just got dull to me after a while. I don't know. It, it was, I don't know if it's because there's limited maps or limited motion or whatever but it just was it just felt like you're doing the same thing all over again now i know i know that probably sounds really funny coming from someone who's done so many exploration episodes on elite but you know uh, to be fair i have voiced my opinion on you know um that if it were up to like just me and i wasn't making youtube videos on it where people were, were enjoying them I don't know that I would keep doing exploration, but since everybody's okay with it and, you know, seems to be like, yes, make more videos, I'm like, okay, whatever. All I do is fly and talk. Not a big deal. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the funniest part, though, was when they started doing things with, um, some of the fighting games have started kind of incorporating more of a story or more character development, or make your own guy. Now that's fun. I like games where you can make your own guy, because then I feel like I'm invested in his training or something. You know, like you're building up your your character within the established story that you already like. You know, so I really, I'm really a big fan of that. Which is part of why I think the two that I've always played the most. I like Tekken, especially when they started doing more about, like, a single-player brawler kind of thing. At least for a mode, there was unlockable equipment and things you could make your- you could customize their look. But the two biggest ones I always played, um, was Soul Calibur. Because at- what was it? Soul Calibur 3, I think, was the first one where they started to where you could make your own guy. And ever since then, it was like you could just make your own guy right off the bat. Um, I still think 3 was one of the best ones in terms of overall packaging because it had a way to make your own guy but then it had like a story driven element there was like strategy it looked like a battlefield map when you were selected it was just kind of cool the way they had everything set up um, the um, the other one is the newest like uh, in the Dragon Ball franchise of Dragon Ball Xenoverse um, I played I mean, I, I've always, growing up, I was a big Dragon Ball Z fan. So when they made, like, video games on it and stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, Dragon Ball! Um, so, like, I think I played all of them up through Budokai... Ooh. 
I know I played Budokai 3. I believe I played Budokai Tenkaichi. And then I think I stopped. I don't think I played any more after that. Um, and then I saw another, you know, they made a couple more Tenkaichis, and then it was like Xenoverse, and I was like, okay, whatever, they're just doing another fighting game. I think part of what, what got old with the Dragon Ball games was when Dragon Ball ended, the story was finished, and so you never really got any new adventures to do. It was always like you were replaying the same story you saw in the anime. So it just kind of got redundant after, like, the third game, where you're like, okay, we're playing the same boss fights, same bad guys, what is the point? Um, and I thought that's what they did with Xenoverse. I was like, okay, it's just another one, whoop de whoop de doo And, uh, when I actually found out that it was like, oh, no, you're part of the time patrol, and you're protecting the timeline, because now the timeline's all skewed, and I was like, that's a really clever way of letting you mix and match and make new battles off of the old established ones. So that was kind of cool. But the, the deal breaker was the RPG fanatic in me that, um... When they were like, yeah, you can make your own guy and fight alongside Goku and Vegeta and all them, I'm like, oh, what? Are you kidding? How did I not know this? You know? So, you know, and that's kind of what gave rise to that um, game music video for the Skillet uh, Feel Invincible song was because I started playing that shortly after, or right before their new album came out, and I fell in love with that album. It was an awesome, awesome, awesome album. So then I was like, Hey, you know what would be really cool is mixing Dragon Ball with this, you know. And and then I made it and it was fun and I enjoyed it and I was like, I gotta show this to people. This look this was I, I had fun making it, so uh, it was kinda one of those like uh, really wasn't expecting it to go anywhere or anything. It was just like I made it, I might as well put it out there. I have a channel, why not? You know? <laughs> so um, I've been happy with Xenoverse 2 though. Um, so far. I've been playing a lot of it. It um, falls a little bit into just a just a hair, not enough to where I would actually like, um, not enough to where I would actually really say it like hurts the game. I would just say in terms of like a review, it may lower the score a little bit. Was the first one was kind of like yes, you're playing the same boss boss fights and things, but. They're, in, they're twisted in a different way. Different things are happening. And I was concerned going into Xenoverse 2 of like, okay, you already did the mix and match, so how are you going to mix and match it again, or are we just going to fall into the, the rhythm again? And they did pretty good. It's There's a couple of them that still kind of feel the same way. Um, where it still kind of feels like, okay, we did this in Xenoverse 1, why are we having to do this again? But as it kind of opens up and continues, it starts kind of veering more and more away from what you did before. Um, one of my favorite twists that they did was actually... Spoiler, I guess. I mean, really, guys? <laughs> I'm saying that, but... Is it really going to spoil anything for anybody? I mean, everybody that's played the games have probably seen the whole show. Anyways, I'm going to spoil something if it hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. Um, the the Frieza fight was very interestingly done because it kind of starts out the way you did it in the original game in Xenoverse. And you're kind of, other than a few things, like, um, I don't think Goku, like, dodges Frieza's blast to where you have to step in and protect people. I think he just blocks it this time. So it's a little different. But overall, I mean, it's still the same kind of fighting in stages of who you fight when. But the the kicker was the final part where Goku finally is like, um, he's a Super Saiyan and everything's kind of down to the wire, the planet's falling apart, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was kind of like, okay, we've done kind of the same thing. This is the same thing that we did in the first game. And then Cooler shows up, and I was like, okay, that's different. That's very different. Um, so that made it kind of interesting. Actually, it felt almost like a tag team where it was like, okay, Goku, you're supposed to fight Frieza anyway, so you take him, I'll take the guy who's not supposed to be here. Um, and so that was an interesting way to do it, of throw in not only a character, but somebody that's like tied to Frieza, being his brother and everything. But I, I like how they did... I like how they incorporated stuff like the movies and uh, GT and stuff, because none of that's considered canon as far as I know. There's only a couple movies and things in the Dragon Ball 
Z world that was actually canon. Um, but there's some things like Cooler and I want to say I'm I my Dragon Ball Z is very rusty, even though I've been playing the games and things. But I mean, like the, the keeping up with the storyline and the animes and things, it's kind of rusty. But I want to say Garlic Jr was considered a canon movie. I don't know if that was one of them or not. But I think there was, like, two of the all of the Dragon Ball Z movies that were actually considered, like, a canon. Like, it, it happened in the story kind of thing. Um, uh, I can't remember which one's off the top of my head, though, but I'm pretty sure there's one or two. But I liked how they incorporated GT, which wasn't canon, and the movies, which weren't canon, by basically saying they're, like split parallel dimensions or d timelines that was really clever that it was basically like hey we can incorporate everything that has ever happened under the dragon ball z banner by basically saying it's an alternate timeline where that happened but in the main timeline that didn't happen and so then these people that can jump around through time are pulling people from other timelines and things and it was like it's simple, but it works really well to to actually um, give you a reason why this is happening and it all makes sense and it's not like you're breaking the story because this didn't happen, so now none of this makes sense. Um, now, I'm curious how they consider Xenoverse and Xenoverse 2. That's the interesting thing for me, is it's like, is the game of Xenoverse considered canon to Akira Toriyama who made the Dragon Ball Z universe? And, because it's kind of a funny, like, inception kind of thing when you think about it, because if he considers the game and the events that take place in the game canon, he actually, by extension, considers everything that ever happened is canon, just canon in other timelines. So it's really kind of interesting if you think about it, the way how he views it could impact things a lot. And I say how he views it because there's a lot of people that debate canon, but to me personally, I've mentioned this before, I haven't really gone into a lot of detail because it's not really... I kind of want people to read it before I talk about a whole lot as far as what I'm planning and things. I kind of want it to be out for people to go get. But I myself and Caden Red Pearl have been working on books and stories and things that we want to do, whether they be books or games or, you know, something. But we want to create our own universes and stories and fiction. And so, kind of coming from an amateur writer, I always look to the writer for the canon because it's their idea. They came up with it. Um... Even when someone else, another studio or something, makes a spin-off or a movie, to me, it, it's, it all comes down to the writer's original vision, basically. Um, now, that's different when, you know, the, it was an older series and the writer died or something like that. But, I mean, as long as the writer's still around and still doing things in the story, I consider them to be the, the rule of canon. It's whatever they say goes. Because there's a lot of people, oh, it's whatever you make it, and if you want it to be, then it's your canon. I'm like, that's, that's, I mean, opinions are like belly buttons and all that, but basically, to me, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's whoever came up with the story d dictates what the story actually is. Um, a good example of that would be like LucasArts with Star Wars and the Expanded Universe. That the Expanded Universe, he didn't stop people from writing, but never actually said, like, this straight up happened. You know, he never acknowledged it in his own works, basically. Um, and then when Disney, you know, and it kind of just became so huge and massive that it turned into its own canon, essentially. It was like canon by just sheer volume. It was like there was so much other authors were writing on other authors' storylines continuing them or including them basically saying they'd happen that it kind of built its own separate canon aside from the main series that lucas did so it kind of became a as long as i don't want to mess with it sure you can go with it kind of status quo and of course that got all upset when disney bought lucas and they dictated a new canon and then it became i liked how they did it though 
that they did it as legends, where it was basically like, there's always myth and legend out there, and you can't really prove or disprove myth or legend until someone comes along and tells you what really happened because they were there, or something to that effect. So it was a really nice strategy to kind of save face, because at first they ticked a lot of people off. You know, when they just were like, nope, Expanded Universe didn't happen. Um, that didn't go well, I don't think. And so then it was like, well, they're legends, so basically, as long as we don't tell you that that didn't happen, you can go ahead and believe that happened. Um, but, so in that regard, they kind of struck a good balance of, you know, as long as we don't override it, that's fine, kind of thing. Um, but I ultimately kind of defer to the main writer for what is canon and what isn't, and so... Like, for example, Toriyama himself is basically like, I don't think GT should have ever happened. Which is why, in most of the things he makes, you never see Super Saiyan 4. Because, in his mind, that never happened. That was a bad idea, kind of thing. Um, and it made a lot... I didn't know that when I first was growing up and watching the show when it was airing in America on Toonami and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're just like, hey, more Dragon Ball, woohoo! You know, I didn't understand how canon worked. It was just cartoons. You know, you're just watching stuff. Um... And after I got older and realized kind of how the production side of things worked, and I found out that he basically disowned that whole series, I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense, because it feels so different. Like, I mean, all one has to do is look at the difference between the transformation between Super Saiyan 3 and Super Saiyan 4, boom. You already can see two different people made it. 3 takes like four episodes or something stupid. I mean, admittedly, there there's drug out, and then there's just like, dude, what are you doing? You know, I mean, there's there's dragging something out, and then there's ridiculous. And Super Saiyan 3 got a little ridiculous that there was... I can't say three or four episodes, that might have been an exaggeration, but I'm 90% sure there was at least an entire episode that basically consisted of Goku yelling. I mean, pretty much. That was, that was like all that happened in that whole episode. Um... And then you get to, like, GT, where, you know, he's in his Uzaru form, and then it's like, you know, hey, you need to control the beast. Okay. <laughs> hey, look, I unlocked a new Super Saiyan level. You know, <laughs> it was like, what? You know. Um, so that was one of those, it was, it was so different, but I didn't understand why. And then when I got older and read up on, you know, the production side of things and realized that he was not a fan of GT and didn't think it should have happened, it was like, oh, so it wasn't made by the original guy. Well, that makes sense, you know. Now I, now I know why it felt so different. Now I will say, the one thing I actually did really like about GT was the Shenron arc. Oh, and by the way, I found out that's because Akira Toriyama came back to kind of clean up the mess and wrote that arc. Go figure. Or at least, at least contributed the idea. I don't know how involved he actually was, but it was like, oh, okay, go figure. The actual cool storyline came from the guy who was like, okay, you guys are going way off base here, let me fix this. Um, and it's like, oh, n no wonder that's the one arc of the story that was actually really cool. Um, it, Baby wasn't bad. Baby was not terrible, because basically it kind of turned Vegeta back into a nemesis again, kind of thing, which was kind of interesting. But I mean, Baby? Really? Could we have not come up with a better name? Guys, seriously? You know, so it had its weak spots, definitely. But the whole making Vegeta bad again was kind of an interesting idea. Um, and so that part was kind of cool, but the Shenron arc was definitely the best one, where it was like, you know, the negative energy of w all the wishes and abusing the power kind of give rise to evil dragons, and now you're actually having to fight Shenron himself, and it was like, okay, this is kind of cool. This is pretty, pretty interesting. That's kind of different. Um, I did like the music, I won't lie. I did like the music of GT. That was pretty cool. Um, but anyways... The point of that was basically that, um, you know, when you've got certain things like the movies or GT or things that wasn't considered canon by the writer, but then if he says something like, because I don't know to what involvement, whoa, this is new, that's different. 
Um, well, actually, I might take the time to scan these because there's three of them. That was really unexpected, actually. Oops. Dang it. Um, okay. Come on. The scanner is so slow. I wish I could upgrade that, but I, I can't upgrade that scanner as far as I know. Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I might pull away from these just a hair, because this would make a really awesome thumbnail, basically. That's kind of what I'm thinking. My, my YouTuber kicked in here all of a sudden. I kind of pulled myself out of my nerd rant. Um, hmm. What would be... I'd like to get, like, more and more than one of these in the shot. That would be kind of cool. Because I want to get a good look at this. This is a really neat... You don't run across this too often. Or I don't, anyway. I'm not saying they're not out there, but I never seem to come across them real often. Oh, so close. I need to go a little bit further back. Let's maybe put the orbit line over there. See if that's far enough. I wonder why that one just went gray all of a sudden. Hmm. Is it, oh, is it because that's the one? Yeah, that's the one I have selected. Okay. Oh, that stinks. There's actually... Wait a minute. Is there... Why do I have four on my radar? What is going on here? Oh, there's one way out there. Okay. A way out there. Do, 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 do. So I might do that. That's a really cool... That is a really cool shot. I like that. Um, I may not worry about scooping right now. And I may not... Oh, we only have four left. Talked my way into all kinds of stuff. Tucked my way all across the galaxy. Um, that's really cool, though. Uh, so, anyways, it's kind of one of those, though. I'm curious how he views the Xenoverse games because it would affect basically the the canon of everything else, pretty much. Which which would be really interesting. Um, because it wouldn't really hurt, because basically you're acknowledging that it happened in parallel timelines and things, not like your main story. But it would be kind of interesting to say that it's some in some way all of that happened. And I don't know his involvement in the Xenoverse games, but I know that in the credits, they do credit him. Um, for... I don't remember if it's for writing the story, or a director, or a producer, what, I don't remember what they credit, but he's, like, involved in the game. I just don't know to what extent. But... And I've seen, I didn't know this, but I heard there was like a only Asian, which kind of sucked for me, because I was like, that would have been kind of cool to play, but I guess it didn't do that well and got shut down anyway. But the um, there was an Asian uh, market only Dragon Ball MMO. And I was like, oh, that would be kind of cool, where it kind of does a lot of what Xenoverse did, in that it's like you're a time patrol person, and there's, you know, you can be pulled throughout time and you start in the future and all that kind of stuff. So they kind of mirrored a lot of the now defunct MMO in the Xenoverse games, which is kind of interesting because the fact that you can play with other players and things like that kind of makes it a hybrid MMO, right? Like it, it almost is like the American or at least worldwide, not just American or Western, but the worldwide attempt to do like a big budget version of like the, the Dragon Ball MMO. But the one thing that I'm really excited about in Xenoverse 2 is some of the things that they're pulling from the defunct MMO that were really neat but never made it over to Western audiences because of the MMO getting shut down and only staying in Asian markets. Um, some of it is like Toa and Mira, I didn't realize the main antagonists of the first games were from, like, the first time you saw them was the MMO. And I was like, oh, they've, they've been around somewhere before. Um, and in this one, and in two, they bring in, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Goku's father, but he's been, like, controlled by Toa. Um, 
so I think I think is uh, Bardock. That's what it is. And so it's like Bardock's in his mask, which was a big thing. Like he was re really super strong and stuff from the MMO again. But that kind of stuff is just really neat that they're bringing a lot of those elements um, from some of the only Asian games that none of the Western audiences ever got to see, and they're actually bringing them in. And if you look them up on like Wikipedia or research them a little bit, some of them are really neat. Like they're really cool ideas that were that I'm excited to see if they're really gonna keep doing and keep adding more from those exclusive games that because there's a there's a certain kind of arcade game I forget the name of it that um, that is popular over in Asia and um, they they have two or three different Dragon Ball Z games that are kind of like taking place around the MMO type of storyline timeline whatever uh, but they're kind of like these arcade... I don't understand how they work. I never really re read into them very much, but they're kind of like an arcade game. And there's been two or three of them that they've made. And one of them I'm excited for, if they actually bring it in, was um, a Super Saiyan 3 Trunks and Vegeta at some point. And I was like, oh, that would be cool. That would be really neat to see. Because um, if you're going by just the show, I believe it's only Goku and... Gotenks. I think. I think Goto, Goku and Gotenks are the only two people that have ever gotten uh, Super Saiyan 3, or that you've seen in the show. And then, like I said, there was other, like, Asian-only market arcade and other games and like the MMO and things where you saw some of the other characters do it or in another timeline or whatever. I don't know that it was Toriyama's idea to have them do that. Um... I know he's working more on, like, the Dragon Ball Super, which... Whoa! Whoa! Holy guacamole! Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that terrified me for a second there. I literally... thought I just jumped into a star. Holy crap. I gotta get away from them, actually. They jumped me right in between two... two stars. Um... Whew! That was unexpected. That was unexpected. You know, game, if you're sick of me talking, you didn't have to throw me at a star. That's a little mean. <sighs> Anyways. This would actually make a good thumbnail as well, because it's like the two white ones. Two, two cyber white or bluish kind of look. Oh, wait. Whoa. Oh, there's another one way over there. I went a lot further than I meant to, actually. That's pretty cool, though. I like it. Oh, that's kind of cool. It's like a whitish yellow and a whitish blue. That's really neat looking. No lightish red, though. Um, and So I guess we're at our destination, so I probably need to wrap this up. That concludes yet another of the Elite Dangerous podcast, essentially. Um, oh, that's weird. The letter's all getting distorted. But anyways, so scan it already. I know I'm moving, but good grief. But yeah, so I think we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, thanks for watching and listening for all of you that stuck through all the way. Uh, cool points to you. Uh, I do. Th I, d I joked with uh, Caden at one point that I've actually debated whenever I joke around like that. Like, ah, you get cool points if you got that reference or things like that. I actually thought about... Um, like on my website or something, having some kind of like chart or board where it would basically show people and their cool points based on different things. Uh, I thought that would be kind of hilarious. But, uh, so yeah, anyways, I think we're going to wrap things up here for this episode. In the meantime, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, and I will see you all next time. Peace.